You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Good Question Podcast. My guest is Dr. Peter Crockford. He's a professor, part of the Faculty of Science in the Department of Earth Sciences at Carleton University. And we had talked about an interesting topic it came up in an article I saw, um, how much life has ever existed on Earth and how much ever will. I thought that was a really interesting question. So welcome, Peter. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, tell me you know, about your normal work at the university and, and what your research is about, and then we'll we'll get into this topic. Sure, sure. So I just came on the faculty here at Carleton uh, this summer. So to be honest, my day-to-day work right now is sort of building course material and getting grants funded and things like that. But in my previous life as a postdoc, most days was just thinking up new ideas and projects to work on, spending a lot of time in the lab uh, and writing and reviewing papers. <laughs> mm. Okay. So how did this question come to your mind? Let's get into it. Yeah, sure. So during my PhD at McGill University, I was measuring the oxygen isotope composition of like ancient salt deposits. So you can imagine we take some seawater, we sequester it from the ocean. And as long as it's a warm, dry environment, we're eventually going to evaporate a lot of that water. And what's left over is a combination of gypsum, some halite, and some other minerals. And what we found in doing that was that we got these really interesting signatures in rocks that were like over a billion years old. And we could relate the signals that we found there to the productivity of the biosphere. And what I mean by productivity is think of the very, very base of the food chain. And we could estimate the rate at which these little microorganisms were producing things like oxygen to the atmosphere. And then over the course of a number of years, we started doing this in ton of different locations. And then we combined this with all sorts of different approaches. And eventually we can cobble together sort of this big, big question, which is an answer to this big, big question, which is how much life has ever existed on the planet, which was really, really fun to do. Yeah. I've thought about how many people have ever lived over all time. And I saw something on, you know, Google's think estimating about 120 billion, mm-hmm. you know, by extrapolating back. But um, so how did you start approaching this question? So if we can get a rate of productivity at a certain time in Earth's history, we can sort of bring that, relate that to how many cells would ever be on the Earth. So today we have 10 to the 30 cells on the planet, which is a huge number that's really difficult to comprehend. You know, it's probably more stars than there are in the universe, for example. And once we have that number in place, we can assume that the rate of primary production, which sort of fuels all the organic matter for all the other things that live on Earth, if we can get a estimate of that at different time points in Earth's history, this gives us a way to estimate how many cells would have existed at that time. And if we do that again and again and again over different uh, intervals of Earth's past, we can cobble together an estimate that, in our case, we suggest about 10 to the 39 cells have ever existed on the planet. But again, how did you estimate that? Did you start with like microbial mats from, you know, let's say 3.8 billion years ago? Like, how did you determine starting conditions and how did you determine how much life they would have been at a given point? Great question. So you we always like to start in the modern environment where we have much better estimates of exactly what's happening. And by having the modern ratio of productivity to cell numbers, then we could take ancient productivity and relate that to cell numbers. But when we get back really, really far in its past, we have to start making more and more assumptions. So for example, when did life first evolve on the planet? That's a really contentious question. And the specific date is quite fuzzy. But we believe that it's somewhere between when the Earth finally cooled off enough to have a environment that was conducive to life, something around 4 billion years ago, and when we really see the first evidence of life, which is around 3.8 billion years ago. And so we sort of have a bound, it must have evolved somewhere sort of in that, those bounds. But because the biosphere would have been so much smaller in Earth's past with, you know, for example, there likely wouldn't have been oxygenic photosynthesis, which fuels most of the planet today. 
And if the biosphere was a lot simpler and it would have been sequestered to sort of these niche environments, it would be so small that it sort of gets lost in the wash of these calculations. It's only until about, say, about 2.4 billion years ago where we have really good evidence that the atmosphere became oxygenated and we would have had a much larger biosphere because of uh, oxygenic photosynthesis just drastically increasing the amount of cells on the planet that we have the majority of the action happening. And once we have constraints for these sort of critical intervals of time, a lot of the less well-known things sort of fall out in the uncertainty. Okay, so what, what is the current estimate? Like, what is production defined as? What is it for today? Let's start with that. Yeah, so production is... The amount of, you can think of it as the amount of CO2 that's incorporated into organic matter. And today that's about 250 billion tons, which is, uh, it's about 250 billion tons. And it's uh, produced by, and the consequence of that is like 10 to the 30 new cells produced every year. Okay. So uh, again, how many are existing at any one point? How many are dying? How many are being created? Is there a net upward trend of life or is it stable? So every single year... So if I was to take a snapshot today of how many cells are on the planet, it would be about 10 to the 30. But maybe unintuitively, most of that cell volume is actually in the subsurface because, or most of the cell numbers in the subsurface. But these are things that are growing incredibly slowly because there's just not that much energy there. But they, we can project quite deep into the Earth's, um, Earth's uh, below the Earth's surface. However, if we just look at cellular turnover times, we actually get a pretty similar number at about 10 to the 30 of new cell production each year. And so when we look at the geologic timescale going from the first life to today, there does seem to be an upward increase in the numbers of cells that have inhabited the planet. Uh, when we move into more recent times, of course, that value has probably fluctuated over the past, say, say 300, 400 million years once, we, once land plants colonized the continents. But for the most part, when you look over, say, 4 billion years, it appears that, yeah, we've increased the amount of life on the planet quite substantially. So what, what fraction of life on the planet is, is metabolically active, and which doesn't even really, like you could say it probably does, almost doesn't participate because it's so slow? Yeah. It sort of depends on the time frame that you're thinking about. So if I said at this exact moment, okay, likely not as much, most of the active stuff happening is obviously close to the surface. In terms of the actual fraction, I don't know have that exactly off the top of my head. Well, yeah. what's your estimate? You know, what's like a ballpark? Is it a minority of all respiration? And is there, oh, sorry, their activity is a majority? Oh, well, if we're thinking about just cellular respiration, certainly like every cell will conduct that to some degree. In terms of, I guess it depends on the units we want to come down on. For the purposes of our work, we're just mainly focused on the primary producers. I'd have to get back to you on that <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, it's okay. I mean, you were talking about production. So is that is production, again, linked to respiration? Or is production just, again, the cycling of carbon within an organism? Like, you know, again, respiration, I think, would be a major part of that, you know, besides the death of the organism or the birth Oh, of it. no, no, absolutely. So for our, like, the main thing that we were focused on was thinking about autotroph. So the base of the food chain that's really converting inorganic carbon to carbon. But you're exactly right that once that material is produced, things are going to consume it. Some of the material is going to be consumed by the autotrophs themselves. And so there's going to be a cascade of things. So for our work, we just related that first step of primary production to the total amount of cells and new cell production on the planet. Well, what about organisms that subsist off of sulfur or methane? Yeah. Are they significant fractions of the total biomass? Did that skew the numbers? So not as much, actually. So certainly for the Archean, say pre-2.5 billion years, these would be much more significant contributors to the overall biosphere than they are today. But in terms of overall, we could put those in the basket of like, say, chemo, uh, chemo lithotrophs. These are things that are getting making a living off of rocks and sediments, and other forms of energy on the planet. They would have dominated for a while, but today they're in the minority. And oxygenic photosynthesis just really dominates uh, the Earth today. So they are a majority? I mean, you know, in places where, again, sulfur bacteria are utilizing the exact surrounding sulfur, there's, I mean, because they're bacteria, I would think they would have tremendous numbers, but even so, they're a tiny fraction of all the existing organisms? Well, a tiny fraction of all the production. So certainly down in the deep yeah. subsurface, you could have really slow growing things that are making a living in a number of different ways. The exact proportion of what metabolisms are operating as we get into the deep crust, I think that's something that's ongoing. There's a lot of people focused on the deep biosphere, but of course, it's not an easy part of the earth to study. 
But in terms of the majority of, say, biomass produced year to year, that's going to be oxygenic photosynthesis dominates that. So the trend has been the now it's it appears to be at a stable le- level or is it trending up or down? If we were to look over the past, say, million years, and we take our cues from the ice core record. So the longest continuous record of ice, I think that they pulled up in Antarctica is about 700 million years and, or sorry, 700,000 years, sorry. The oldest ice people have found at this point, I think is about 2 million years, but this isn't really a continuous record. But within that ice, there's old cat bubbles that contain you know, CO2, O2, and give you a nice sample of the atmosphere. And when people have looked at the isotopes of that O2, they've come up with estimates of the productivity of the biosphere in a similar way that some of my PhD work did using ancient salts. And it appears that productivity hasn't, global productivity hasn't varied too much, which is a little bit unintuitive when you think of the last glaciations, for example. And the idea is that maybe the marine well, marine realm uh, became a bit more active over these intervals of time. When we go further back, there might have been higher productivity, say, for example, in the Mesozoic around the time when dinosaurs were around. But when we look on very long time scales, it appears that we're sort of in this stable, high productivity interval at the moment. Yeah. What percentage of all carbon on Earth is cycled by life? Is there an estimate of that? If we were to look at the total amount of carbon on the planet and ask how much of that How many times has the biosphere cycled that, for example? We would get an estimate that's about 100 to 1,000 times the amount of the total amount of carbon on the planet. So what does that look like? If you were to like look out at the moon tonight, now just imagine all of that is just a ball of carbon, okay? That's about the amount that the biosphere has cycled over the entire lifetime of the planet, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, but in relation to all the carbon on Earth, you say it's about a 1,000 times, but over a huge time scale. Yes. So like in, maybe I mean, let's relate it to a year, like in uh, what is the total production effect? How much, what percentage of the carbon does it cycle? In terms of a percentage. Yeah, even if it's real crude, like what would be your estimate? Let's see here. I think that's, I think it's one ten million a year. Okay. So it's a very, very small fraction of all available carbon. Keep in mind though, that most of Earth's carbon is not at the surface. Okay, Most is tied up in the deeper Earth. So the biosphere does not have access to... So in terms of the amount of carbon that's actually at the surface that the biosphere even has access to, certainly that number goes up quite a bit. However, I don't can, have... Can you that like available carbon? And is there an estimate of how much there is there? Well, you could think of it as like, say, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, just as a, a reference point, and that would be about a quarter of it every single year. And what about the fraction and soils... That plants and you know other creatures would have access to and in the yeah sea. that I would have to get back to you on because I don't have those numbers at the at my fingertips right now or the amount of dissolved organic carbon in the ocean in terms of real numbers at my fingertips here. Okay, well, understanding these numbers, what what does that lead to in terms of you know thoughts? What consequences are there? What you figured out? I think we're living in a time right now where we're looking at exoplanets. We're actually starting to contextualize Earth in relation to a lot of these other new planets that we're discovering every day. Of course, we don't have direct imaging of these things. A lot of our observations are simply sort of the the amount of time it takes for these to orbit around their home star, maybe the mass of these things. But it certainly caught the attention of a lot of public's interest and a lot of researchers are thinking very hard about what these planets could be like. And one of the fun things about this work is that it sort of provides a benchmark of just, you know, at some point life originated on this, you know, third rock from the sun. And how much has it been able to house over that, say, four billion years of biospheric history to now? And we can even go further and say how much life will ever exist as the sun continues to heat up and eventually at some point the earth will become uninhabitable. But this provides a benchmark to compare some of these other planets to, especially when we think about water worlds or places that we think could be habitable, which I think is a fun thing to think about. Another, on the other side, uh, when we think of just exploring our own solar system, one thing that this work really made me think deeply about was like, for example, when I was a kid and I would read Arthur C. Clarke's work on, uh, you know, 2001, 2010, 2061. And there's parts of that book where they go to Europa and there's these 
creatures there and things where I think doing this work really made me think deeply about how much evolutionary time you have and how many cells you really need for that. And that the odds of finding anything that's not just like a very, very simple organism is effectively zero in some of these uh, icy moons, for example. So what do you think will be the trajectory of life, you know, over the next, I don't know, a thousand or so years? Will it be stable or is it going to experience some significant difference? Over the next thousand years, I think that's really our choice as a species. You know, we're sort of endeavoring on early steps of sort of planetary engineering at the moment. You know, there's discussions about injecting aerosols into the atmosphere to manage the albedo of the planet to sort of govern the temperature. There's work to be done to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, or but even if you think of just how much we're putting in, you know, these are very large scale planetary experiments that we're running. And so I think over the next thousand years, it's really difficult to predict because humans are becoming such a powerful influence over that. So that I think is is challenging to say. I would say that if we continue on our where we are today and save that no major wars and certainly non-nuclear wars, then hopefully it's at a similar level that we are today. Moving forward, though, at some point, that's going to change quite drastically. Going back in time, though, I just I just realized were there periods where um, the production was way down, let's say during the last you know active ice age or during a period where there was tremendous volcanic activity. Can anyone see that, you know, the historical record of climate? So in terms of the last ice age year, the ice core work that I was alluding to sort of showed that the amount of productivity on the planet on the whole doesn't go down a heck of a lot, which was a, which I think is a really surprising finding. Even if you look at, say, major extinction events, so say the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, yes, there was a major reduction in the productivity of the planet, but it only lasted for a relatively short interval. And so, yes, there would be a period where things go down by a fair bit, but microbes can bounce back quite fast. The In terms of long durations where the amount of life on the planet and productivity dropped extremely substantially would be during an interval of time about 720 million years ago to 635 million years ago, which is this interval called the cryogenian. And over this time, there was two what are called snowball earth glaciations. So the whole planet would have been covered in ice from pole to equator. And over one of these states, you would have had a major barrier to photosynthesis in marine waters with all of that ice. Life likely would have been confined to little cracks in the ice, maybe uh, little ponds on the surface, and the amount of production on the planet would have gone down enormously. And that would have been sustained for the durations of these glaciations, which the best estimates today, I believe, suggest the first one, the Sturdian, lasted 55 million years, and the second one about 5 to 10 million years. So these would have been major productivity drops in the in the biosphere. Well, were, were they? Was this corroborated with ice cores, or did it not seem to corroborate? No, no, sorry. These were events that are 720 million years ago. Oh, okay. So, yeah, these are just our inferences that we can make from the geologic record. Well, what do people think was happening during the last ice age so that productivity barely fell? Well, I think it really comes down to nutrient cycling in the ocean and ocean circulation. So this is something that's still actively being worked on. So the dynamics of, say, carbon moving from the ocean to the atmosphere during these glaciations, it's still a big problem that people are still trying to figure out. And so the simple answer is, of course, productivity just went up in the ocean, and it was probably because there was more nutrients in more regions of the ocean than there are today. And that sort of kept productivity at a relatively similar level to today, even though the northern hemisphere was largely much more covered in ice. But exactly how that worked, there's a lot of people working on this, looking at marine records and trying to figure out exactly how these environments function under quite different conditions. Okay. So what are, what are some questions you think that all this work will, uh, will generate, you know, now and in the future for other scientists? So I think that one thing that came out of this was that there's some intervals that we just clearly need to understand a little bit better. So of course, in our work, we present some uncertainties that we just can't get past at this point. And a lot of that centered around a time period, which we collectively call it the Great Oxidation Event. So that would have started around 2.4 billion years ago. And this is when Earth got its first significant O2 into the atmosphere. And there's a lot of debate exactly what the dynamics of this time, the 
ultimate trigger? Was it the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis or was it just this metabolism kind of got supercharged and emerged to be much more ecologically prominent? That's still debated quite a bit. But over this interval of time, productivity estimates vary by a huge amount. So by orders of magnitude. And one of the kind of crazy things that happens when you're living on a microbial planet is there's nothing to really buffer you against extremely high O2. Not in the same way, at least as today, where we would, if we put O2 too high in the atmosphere, we're going to end up with a whole bunch of forest fires that's going to bring us back down. And what our study showed was just really sort of highlighted this uncertainty and how it you can imagine two completely different trajectories with, you know, maybe a thousand fold difference in the size of the biosphere over this, you know, 100 to a few hundred million year interval. And I think it really draws attention to that specific time and really calls a lot more work to be done on it to figure this out in much more detail. So what does current analysis of production do for it today? What does it tell us? You mean in terms of just understanding primary productivity in the modern environment or? Yeah, like in the modern environment. I mean, it's been stable for quite a long time. It's like, is barring any crazy events or mega shifts that should stay at kind of about the same level is what it sounds like. But is there any other uh, benefit to our understanding? it? Certainly the major players is important to think about. So today this is being done by a combination of trees, marine algae, cyanobacteria, understanding the distribution of those things, what species have sort of taken over at different times to become more and more important is just an interesting question, seeing as, you know, it's major one of the major parts that drives sort of Earth's biogeochemical cycles. I think that's very interesting for academic reasons. And then you sort of go down and think about in a more granular scale of just, you know, forest health, what happens if we make major changes in over landscapes and things? Those sort of lead to more interesting questions. But some of these big numbers, just looking at a planetary scale, well, we don't really expect it to change much. I'm not struggling to think of exactly why, uh, what people do with those numbers on a day-to-day basis. Probably not a lot, to be honest. <laughs> well, if people try to segment, you know, production to different, you know, to again, the water, to the air, to different biomes, maybe then you could evaluate, all right, production should be this in the desert, but it seems to have uh, gone way up or gone way down for some Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And within specific regions of the planet, it gets quite interesting. That's exactly right. Any of those are conclusions from looking at it in specific regions? Has anyone done this? Yeah. So um, there's actually tons of work being done on this. Of course, you can imagine like what are the consequences of sort of transitioning huge swaths of the Amazon to from jungle to agricultural land or understanding, for example, exactly where productive zones are in the ocean and where unproductive zones of the ocean in is also very interesting. An example of that would be, you know, one climate mitigation technology that's on the table is basically dumping things like iron into the ocean to fertilize it and use that as a climate mitigation strategy. So that starts with sort of having an idea of how different regions of the ocean operate and having a very deep knowledge of exactly what that ecosystem is lacking and what would happen if you were to had that missing ingredient and how much bang for your buck would you get? So those sorts of things, I think, is where some of this sort of bubbles up and and becomes much more relevant to many pressing questions today. Well, going forward, how does this dovetail with your um, intended research? So my work is mostly focused on just trying to refine our understanding of Earth's past and looking at the productivity of the biosphere, how much life has been around is just one aspect of that. But there's other things that we also want to think about. How much oxygen was in the atmosphere through time? What were CO2 levels? How reliable is the rock record that we're looking at? And how can we sort of make checks and rechecks? And the way you have to do that is go out into the fields, gather samples of the right age, take them back to the lab. I would say do the analyses, but I'm sort of at the stage now where it's trained students to do the analyses and then share it with the community. So that's uh, that's what I have to look forward to for the next while. Yeah, very good. Peter, what's the best way for people to, you know, to follow your research and to see uh, more about what we've spoken about today? Yeah. So check out my website. It's just petercrockford.rocks. Check out web pages at Carleton University or look up on Google Scholar or find me at Earth to Pete on Twitter. And yeah, that's usually where I'll post latest and greatest stuff coming out of the lab. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me.
Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at thegoodquestionpodcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit thegoodquestionpodcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast. 